Hello, everyone, and welcome to That's Not True. My name is Dr. D, and it is fantastic to be with you here today. I'm here, and I'm joined with many of my special guests. Perhaps you know some of my guests. I'm here with Eric Giroux, with Georgie Jett, and Kitty Chang. And you guys, we went down under tonight. What we've got is Kitty with us from Australia, Georgie from the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, and bringing up the South is Eric there in Tampa. You guys, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank well, you this is exciting. This is, you know, as you may know, our uh, third show. So we've only got one more of these left. Now, Eric, I want to start with you. But before we do that, I want to kind of tell everybody how That's Not True works. How That's Not True works is individuals just like you are writing in to ask me questions, the doctor, about maybe some health myth that you've heard. Perhaps um, there's something that you've always followed, a bit of nutrition, food, sleep, or exercise advice. And it started to kind of tick in the back of your brain and you want to know, am I doing it right? right? We see this so much with fitness and form and what's the best diet. Is there the right diet to follow, right? And so I often say to people, there's my way, there's your way. As for the right way, that's still up in the air, right? But this is why we come together and socially gather the way we are tonight so that we can kind of get through some of those myths. And that's why I always invite some panelists that can ask some questions. You're going to learn from them and we're going to grab some questions for you. So please be sure to put in some questions in the Q&A box so that we can go back and find those. Just do me a favor. When you do it, say, Dr. D, I've always heard ask your question and then ask me, is that true? And I'll let you know if it's a half truth, a full truth, or that's not true, right? You guys, let's get started. Eric, I do want to start with you. Um, you, um, you actually um, had a question that comes up very commonly. So why don't you share with us your question? Awesome. Thanks, Dr. D. So Dr. D, I've always heard that drinking milk from another animal isn't necessarily the best for a human being. <laughs> okay, this is <laughs> hands down one of the most popular questions that get sent in. And it's true. It is not the best practice to be consuming milk from another animal. Um, we are just fine um, with the foods that we eat, as long as you eat foods in their natural state, that you eat fat in its natural state, and you consume protein according to your age, your activity level, right? You know, the idea here, and this is where I think a lot of the confusion comes from, is that it's not that milk and its protein is without benefit. Obviously, right, breast milk, um, served us very, very well. And um, milks, milk formulas or mimic formulas that mimic milk obviously serve as growth factors. And that's one of the big players in milk is that it's a growth factor. So there comes a point in time where we have to ask, what else are you trying to grow? Because there are some problematic links to the protein that's in dairy. That's in dairy. A lot of people will say, well, I'm not lactose intolerant. Listen, it doesn't stop with lactose. There's casein protein in there. And caseinates have been highly problematic. Now, the most accepted version of the problems that people have with dairy, and when I say the most accepted, is that this is something that the jury is still very much out on. When we look at conventionally trained practitioners versus traditionally trained practitioners versus practitioners that are trained in some of the alternative health arts, not everybody's coming together and saying that's true and that's part of the problem. But what most of the experts can agree on is that dairy is very problematic when it comes to having a very healthy gut biome or what's often referred to as a gut barrier. 
um, you know, to keep the bad stuff out and allow the good stuff in requires a very healthy barrier. And dairy products have been shown to increase what's called permeability of the gut. And that means that proteins can get places where they're not supposed to be. Pathogens can get places where they're not supposed to be, when otherwise you would have been able to keep them out. Um, at the end of the day, there's really no good literature that says that or maybe I want to say it this way. At the end of the day, there's more literature that has a problem with dairy than doesn't have a problem with dairy, right? So I often say for every gimme, there's a gotcha. And it does seem when you look at the literature that dairy, for every step forward it may give you, you go two steps back. Um, magnesium and vitamin D every day of the week outperform calcium when it comes to bone mineral density. This is shown in studies. Uh, this is shown whether calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium are given by themselves. Um, just given uh, magnesium and vitamin D or vitamin D and K2, or some of these, as I said, mixed with calcium. They find that what's really doing the heavy lifting in aging and bone mineral density is actually, and cardiovascular health, I should throw that in there, is um, vitamin D and magnesium. So many of the things that we attribute to dairy, meaning that what a great source of calcium, um, really doesn't bear out in life, right? We do much better with dark green leafy vegetables, not dairy products. If you want your calcium, and I highly recommend that you do, right? Dark green leafy vegetables are a brilliant place to get them. You know, I often talk to people about never take a nutrient in isolation. And when you look at dark green leafy vegetables, they're just packed with nutrients in addition to some functional starches, right? Things that are going to help with blood sugar. Um, dark green leafy vegetables are really where it's at. But what I wanna go back to when it comes to dairy is that that hyperpermeability, that concern that we have with inflammation in the gut. Because when inflammation is left unchecked, um, other hormones, inflammatory markers that may lead to immune dysfunction kind of go off the rails. And so that immune response and inflammatory response is quite significant. It's linked, whether it's um, um, over time, it's linked to a broad range of acute and chronic uh, illnesses. Where I think most people fall short, believing that dairy is the culprit, in their diet, Eric, is that sometimes that inflammation, that slow boil of immune dysfunction, it's just that. It's a slow roll, right? It's a slow boil. But that doesn't mean that the inflammation, while subclinical, isn't persistent. And we have to think over time what's happening with that. Now, the other thing I think is worth bringing up, and this one's a little less accepted when we look at the broad range of individuals. Um, this one's a little bit less accepted, but that caseinate protein um, does something in the body that they call molecular mimicry. And molecular mimicry is where a protein, in this case, mimics another hormone and uh, mimics another peptide, mimics another protein in the body. And caseinate can mimic, um, re, um, can mimic peptides or proteins that stimulate reward center in the brain, including opioid receptors. So there's a big concern with addiction. And it's not, um, the problem is Eric, that it's not looked at the way addiction in the United States is looked at, right? Um, it's looked out less like a drug addiction and more like a coffee addiction. But people do have withdrawal from um, dairy products. They do have a hard time kicking that habit. And today the literature tells us a little bit more why. Because the dairy peptide or the dairy protein, because of its peptide, peptide structure, does mimic other molecules. And those other molecules are the ones that are stimulating reward and addiction centers in the brain. So it's worth kicking that habit. As a friend of mine, Dr. Dan Wachowski often says, he says, you need to break up with dairy. And for some people, that's exactly what it feels like is that they have to break up with it. 
if you do still love dairy, the creaminess, those sorts of things, looking at sheep's or goat's milk is a much better option because it's not shown to have that same molecular mimicry. I hope that um, was helpful. I hope that was um, a, a good one. Um, I hope it wasn't too much, but if, if we have to simplify it, Eric, yes, you're absolutely right. It's not a good idea to be consuming a lot of dairy. And there's so many other options through food sources, supplement sources for us to be able to get a much more robust mineral uh, in our diet. And I suggest that you do them in combination, right? Um, that you make sure you're also getting magnesium, that you make sure that you're also getting iron, that you're also getting zinc. There's so many other things. And at the end of the day, superfoods are superfoods, dark green leafy vegetables, they're doing the heavy lifting. So that's a great question. And it's a really, um, it's a really common uh, question. Okay, now we're going to go to the field. And maybe I should have told you guys that's what we want to do with that. I'm going to ask my panelists the question. And then we're going to see something that came in from the field. And this one I really loved. And um, because it, it got kind of geeky. Um, Kimmy um, uh, asked this question. She said, I heard that doing squats uh, can help mature women increase secretion um, of human growth hormone that reduces with age. Um, is that true? Um, yes, that is absolutely true, but it's not unique to body weight squats. It's unique to large muscle groups moving under load. Mm -hmm. And here's the fun part, um, moving under load in any number of ways. So while body weight squats are one of them and definitely a lot of people's favorites for rounding out uh, the, uh, the rump, right? One of the things that is really fun about exercise and human growth hormone is that it doesn't matter if you're cycling, it doesn't matter if you're running, as long as you do it for a long enough period of time, it doesn't matter if we're talking about an elliptical, it doesn't matter if we're talking about high intensity interval training, maybe you're doing sprints, right? Another great way to round out the booty is to sprint all you got, right? <laughs> Up a steep hill, 200 feet or better. And that's another great thing that you can do. What are other things that you can do to improve human growth hormone? Um, definitely keeping your body composition in a healthy, uh, or your body composition, a healthy composition range, meaning your body fat percentage is um, to the uh, normal, low normal or athletic range. Interestingly enough, getting really, really lean can start to go the other direction. Hormones have a sweet spot. Um, too much and too little are a problem. So we're always looking for that sweet spot. And so being way below essential fat or getting near essential fat body fat percentage, that's not always a good idea. And um, there are different amino acids that are very beneficial for improving human growth hormone. Arginine, citrulline, these are two of what we would consider power players. Um, can we sometimes it's identifying what are your risk factors for low uh, growth hormone and age isn't the only one that's a concern. Individuals that kind of burn their candles at both ends that are always stressed. Um, exercise is going to be perceived as just an additional stressor. Now, don't freak out, right? Um, because many people, that's exactly, exercise is how they de-stress, right? And so that response of someone that uses it for de-stressing, right? they're sending out all kinds of great chemicals in their body when they're doing that. They're not perceiving that necessarily as stress. Um, but individuals that, you know, are just getting it in and fitting it in, um, and they're just, they're getting it in and fitting everything in with no time for recovery, um, we actually start to see human growth hormone decline in those individuals. So recovery is a, a really big um a really big player in human growth hormone. It is true that HGH or your natural secretion of human growth hormone such starts to decline as you age. The earlier Kumi or your um, individuals listening start those body weight squats, start um, the lower leg, in particular large muscle exercises, leg presses are uh, considered hugely beneficial um, as a measure of your cardiovascular function and your brain function in later decades of life. 
So if we're going to focus on something for exercise, uh, for human growth hormone, for longevity, we're going to focus on leg strength. Uh, today, we do understand that leg strength is intimately linked to healthy brain aging, brain volume, um, reaction time. Um, it's also intimately linked to the health of your heart. Um, it's one of the things that we really want to make sure, whether we're in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, that we can press a lot with our legs. So if you're going to focus on something for all of these factors, that's what I would focus on. The one thing that I want to answer in this question that's important is that this isn't just about exercise. I'd mentioned stress reduction and healthy body weight, but I think it's underappreciated how important sleep is for mm -hmm. human growth hormone secretion. So we need to remember that it, you have to apply a pretty good amount of intensity. And I know you guys are getting sick of me saying that, that intensity is um, the major player in whether or not running is good for you. Well, how intense was it? Um, is mm -hmm. lifting weight through strength training or resistance training, is that the right exercise? Well, I don't know. How intense was it? So I know you guys sometimes get sick of me saying, well, did you make it intense? <laughs> right? But that's actually going to be one of the key factors here is if you don't exercise intensely, then sleep is actually going to be your best growth hormone um, promoter. So getting a good night's sleep, sticking to routine, we have to appreciate that we sleep if we're doing it right for a good number of hours. And that's when we get that great area under the curve for human growth hormone. Okay. That was a great question, Kumi. And one of my um, favorite topics to help people kind of connect the dots to lifestyle and aging. So I really appreciate um, getting that one. Let's go to you, uh, Georgie. Um, when we, um, um, when you and I, because you and I worked together for a really long time, and I know that you now have grandbabies, which is very exciting. Um, um, but with grandbabies also comes um, questions about um, their health and their immunity. So lay it on me. What was your question? Well, Dr. D, I have heard <laughs> that the cause of eczema is limited to external factors. Is that true? Um, that is not true. That is so not true. <laughs> that doesn't even get like a shake of my head. That gets so. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is oh, not my. true. I I'll tell you why people think it's true and why most, for most people, there's not an argument around this, but because it's eczema also goes by the name atopic dermatitis. Um, a lot of people will just say, oh, no, that's contact dermatitis, or it's something you came in contact with. It's, you know, this uh, atopic dermatitis is, is nothing more than that. And, and I'll tell you that the literature is just not on their side. While, while it is true that detergents and perfumes, um, that colorants, that artificial colors and things like that, um, you know, chemicals, obviously, I mean, stop it, the yard, of course, you know, mm -hmm. if you're gonna, if you if you get pesticides on you or something like that, of course. Um, but one of the things that I think is missing in that link is that the reason why someone can come in contact with a perfume or a colorant, um, a detergent, a scent, and have it cause eczema is because their body's literally having an immune response to it. Um, immunoglobulins are going out, antigens are being built, inflammation is starting to build up, and they're having a full-blown immune attack. Um, um, we do see atopic dermatitis or eczema more commonly in children. And part of this is because they're establishing um, Part of this is because they are establishing their immune system. Um, we do see less um, eczema in breastfed babies, for example, that get a lot of those proper immunoglobulins through breast milk. It's one of the reasons why you see some formula blends, some probiotic blends like um, Probiotic Plus or the Probiotic Extra for infants was formulated with what are called GOS and FOS. So this is fructooligosaccharides and galactooligosaccharides. And they mimic breast milk. They mimic the immune bump that we get from breast milk. So it's not that 
breastfed babies are the only ones that get the benefits of not getting eczema because there are, we know a lot, we know so much more about this today. There's ways to help kids. Um, one of the other reasons why I don't think it gets paid attention to properly, Georgie, is because a lot of kids grow out of it. So we see it with kids. They've got thin skin. They're sensitive. They're building up their immune systems. Um depending on the quality of their formula, depending definitely on the quality of breast milk, how well did they do, right? Eczema, um, which is different than cradle cap. Um, um, eczema is something that we see, but we also see toddlers grow out of it. And then I think a lot of people just kind of wipe their hands of it and just say, well, that's, you know, that's not anything I have to worry about. And this is where I get really concerned because um, there's a big difference between, say, being sensitive to something and literally being allergic to it. And if, if there's been any disservice to atopic dermatitis, eczema, or some of these chronic immune skin conditions that children deal with, and then because it, it can follow you into later life, we just give it other names, right, in later years. But, you know, one of the things I think that really does us a disservice is that somewhere, it got lumped, eczema got lumped into food sensitivity instead of food allergy. And so you'll run into a lot of people, Georgie, that will say, well, that doesn't even exist. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, like ask any parent with a child with a peanut allergy that has to call the elementary school to make sure that nobody brings peanut butter to the school, like if food allergies aren't real, right? So that's the big issue is that somewhere the waters got really muddy with food sensitivity, which is simply um, maybe the abundance of a food protein can cause gas, bloating, irritability, um, um, changeable bowels, and you're sensitive to a food, which means, you know, you don't want to eat that food again. And if you eliminate that food, you can sometimes pepper it in without any ill effect because it's really just the abundance of your immune system being exposed to a certain food product that leads to a sensitivity. But allergies, Georgie, are far more, um, well, they're, they're a little bit more instant. They don't have to be like this, right? It doesn't have to be like all of a sudden you get swollen to actually be an allergy. Allergies, the reason why I'm, I, I'm concerned about things getting eczema being lumped into food sensitivity is because allergies are, uh, you know, they're invoking an actual immune response, an immune cascade, an immune attack, and left unneutralized, untethered, unmitigated. That goes on for a long enough period of time, and you will harm the body. Um, the immune system becomes harmed. It becomes very hypersensitive. And now we're kind of back to Eric's question about that slow boil and then what, and then when does it boil over and how does it boil over in joint dysfunction? Does it boil over in, um, you know, more than an allergy, but, you know, actual atypia of, or problems with the cells in the gut. And the one thing that really proves that eczema or atopic dermatitis is an immune complex an immune response and not a food sensitivity, which means we need to take it seriously with how we feed our kids, how well we uh, support their immune system with things like probiotics, healthy foods, fiber, um, in, in particular, like chicory root or apple pectin, Jerusalem artichoke. These are all really good starches for kids to be eating because it creates the right fodder in their gut. But the biggest concern, I guess, that I have about how the waters got muddied is that eczema is intimately linked into an immune triad. And that triad is when we see eczema in children, we often see asthma in children. We often see attention um, issues in children. Um, and for that reason, it's, it's a really good idea um, that if we do see eczema or some kind of persistent atopic dermatitis in a child, um, that we really pay attention to um, respiratory health um, because that child is at higher risk for concerns of asthma. And that we make sure that we pay attention to their diet with things like methylated B vitamins, no dairy in their diet, no gluten in their diet, because this triad does include attention issues, whether that's a hyperactivity, uh, whether it is 
um, a, um, you know, high functioning, but, um, but concerns that we have with children on the spectrum, we, we often see um, the eczema and asthma go with those neurologic concerns. So anything that we can do to support a child's neurologic, metabolic, and digestive health is going to be you know, profoundly beneficial to their growth and their development. So um, thank you, Georgie, for asking thank such you. a great question, because it, it allowed me to go off a little bit on my own little like, we should pay attention to what we put in our face and we should really pay attention to what goes in children's faces. So thank you for that. Um, interesting that you would ask a question about something like that, that would allow me to kind of venture into galacto, uh, galacto oligosaccharides or fructo oligosaccharides that kind of mimic breast milk. And um, because we did get a question from, um, Laura, oh my gosh, how did I forget? How did I not realize this was Laura? So Laura Smith from Buffalo, New York writes, she says, when it comes to choosing a fiber powder, I've heard some people say that they're all the same and it doesn't matter which one you take. Is that true? That is not true. That is so not true. <laughs> um, fibers are very different. Obviously, you might know them, you know, you classify them in soluble and insoluble fibers, but even within within the category of soluble fibers, um, we have um, functional fibers or what are often referred to as functional starches or resistant starches. So what makes a fiber awesome is where its carbon links are and how branched a fiber is um, matters. And so some of these resistant starches um, like chicory roots, a great example. It's a fructo oligosaccharide. It's highly branched. It's incredibly complex. And because it's so branched, it um, is not easy fuel. Like if you want to have a healthy gut, you don't want your fuel to be overly efficient, right? And that's, and I know that sounds counterintuitive because you say, why wouldn't I want an efficient fuel? You don't want anything that will be assimilated into the body for sugar quickly, right? Gut bugs, bad gut bugs love simple carbohydrates. They love simple um, 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 fibers that are easy to get through. They don't like the branch stuff. So the more efficient your fiber, right? We mean the, le the least, um, less complex it is, um, the more apt bad bacteria are going to kind of rise up and um, the less, um, the less well you'll be able to control things like healthy cholesterol or keeping blood sugars within healthy ranges. Um, even bowel regularity, the more branch or resistant that fiber is, the better off you are. Now, one misnomer, it's not a misnomer because we're not talking about a name, sweet Christmas. One of the misconceptions about fiber because it's a carbohydrate is that it contributes significantly to, car to carbohydrate load that it um, contributes significantly to your um, carbohydrate numbers. And soluble fibers, uh, while counted as a part of net carbs, um, are so branched that they don't contribute meaningfully to blood sugar. And what I mean by that is that they can keep blood sugars regulated, right? They can keep them in a much healthier range because they are not assimilated at like we think of other carbohydrates. So even people that eat a ketogenic lifestyle um, um, can do really well with some functional or resistant starches because they're not, they're not considered a meaningful part of the carb count. And so I think that's important to also understand. Um, also, one of the things to pay attention to is that certain fibers really do a good job feeding some bacteria while other good bacteria maybe like a different kind of fiber. That's why things like, um, um, like inulin and apple pectin, Jerusalem artichoke, these are really unique fibers that create short chain fatty acids in the gut. And short chain fatty acids are an incredibly um, high energy source for the body and your gut, your intestine really needs that high energy source because it's got a lot of turnover. There's a lot going on in the intestines from nutrient absorption to inflammation balance, to transit time. 
And so you want something there that's going to make all of those cells that are making that happen, that have mm -hmm. a pretty rapid turnover. You want them to have a, a good supply of an energy source. And so that's why resistant starches, inulin or chicory, um, uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinically um, evidenced um, resistant starches like Fibrosol 2 and the NutriClean fiber powder. You know, these are all reasons why you would, you would not just go and get something over the counter because some fibers are meant to be purgative. Some fibers are meant to ke help keep blood sugars within healthy ranges or help keep your cholesterol within a healthy range, right? Um, help support healthy bowel movements. You know, these are all things that good fibers do. And, and frankly, you know, you can slap fiber on a lot of different supplements, but it may not be functional fiber. It may not be a resistant starch and it may not feed the good bacteria. So that's a great question, Laura. I'm glad uh, that you asked. The other thing I guess I would add to that is that many, um, you know, many fiber supplements become functional because they add other functional ingredients like probiotics to them, right? So while that fiber, if it's a resistant starch, is a prebiotic, right? Then, um, you know, adding probiotics just gives you another functional ingredient. So if you're looking at probiotics, just so um, you're, uh, you have this little bit of knowledge, you don't ever want to choose just one probiotic. Um, as much of the fame as lactobacillus acidophilus got is just one, right? Mm -hmm. And what we know about the way probiotics work is that you need a diversity of probiotics. You don't need a ridiculous number of them if you have a, a wide diversity of them. But even everything from a lactobacillus family wouldn't be, um, and in this case, it's a genus, but um, um, everything from that genus isn't you know, if all of them come from the same genus, that's not going to help you. You need them to come from different genuses. You need them to have different function. And this is why you see a lot of bifobacterium in um, whether it's fiber or probiotic supplements. And you'll see lactobacillus, you'll see um, Saccharomyces boulardii, you'll see um, things like lactobacillus coagulans or lactospore. You'll see them coming from different phyla or different genuses. And that's what you want. You want a lot of diversity when you look at something like that. So that's a great question, uh, Laura. Thank you for that. Let's go back to our panelists. Kitty from down under, Australia, Melbourne, visiting us. Um, Kitty, you, um, you have been such a great proponent of 28 Days of Health and have really encouraged people um, to, you know, get out there and move the needle in their health. And you, you have a question um, that I think is something that everybody needs to hear. So go ahead, lay it on me. All right. Dr. D, I've always heard that healthy adults need at least eight hours of sleep per night to function at their best. Is that true? It is mostly true. <laughs> Actually, the eight hour um, sleep, um, we call it an eight hour sleep myth individuals need somewhere between seven and a half and nine hours. Let's hear it for the nine hour sleep night, right? Um, you know, and it's funny because genetics are actually what dictate this. Um, so here, I'm just, I mean, a lot of ton of people off the hook right now. <laughs> um, there is something called um, a chrono sleeper or a chronotype. And um, about 30% of us are like, just get up, we just, we're awesome in the morning, right? But we're not going to be good at night. Um, some of us are night owls. About a third of individuals are night owls. And then about a third of people are the mixed type, right? They're, they're doing okay. They don't want to get up in the morning, but they're not really interested in, in staying up till four in the morning um, either. Or they at least would never describe themselves as good at, as good at four in the morning. I have a great friend, Brandy Murphy. She's fantastic at two in the morning. That's she's that's her chronotype and if she and I could figure out how to like just blend that because I like to get up at four in the morning right we just we've got this two hour window where we can't get any work done <laughs> so, but we she and I have just very different chronotypes and it is genetic you know I I giggle with some people when I tell them that there is a chronotype because um I I tell them um it's genetic 
And, um, you know, some people just say, I cannot get to work on time. And they want to know, is that also genetic? So you should know there is actually a gene for that. And um, the people that just cannot get somewhere on time. And again, it has a lot to do with the chrono type or the way our cells listen to the clock around us. And daylight hours play a really big um, part of that. When the sun goes down, your hypothalamus, um, your um, pituitary gland notices that the hypothalamus notices that it changes um, eating habits. You're not supposed to eat after the sun goes down um, because you're, we're not getting the right signals to digest that, to do something with the blood sugars, all kinds of stuff, right? So let's just break it down like this because a question had come in through MA Healthy Living about is it true that we sleep in 90 minute cycles? And I want to clarify that because it's a great part of your question. We do sleep in 90 minute cycles. That doesn't mean you wake up every 90 minutes or that you should wake up every 90 minutes. In fact, fragmented sleepers are in a lot of trouble when it comes to brain aging. So we want to make sure that we sleep through the night. Um, so that's how a sleep cycle works is at the beginning of a sleep cycle, there's non-REM sleep. We call this slow wave sleep or deep sleep. And then at the latter part of your seven and a half to nine hours, you're going to be getting REM sleep. And this is kind of, this is like the memory banks. This is where you're just, you know, categorizing everything, consolidating everything, putting it into a little data flash drive, right? And then you wake up in the morning and you get to do it all again. And that happens every 90 minutes during sleep. And as the sleep cycles go on, a greater proportion of that 90 minutes will be dedicated to REM versus deep sleep. So the issue with a lot of sleepers, Kitty, is that if you go to bed late, you miss out on a portion. And if you go and if you wake up, if if you wake up really early, and I should clarify that, if you don't have a sleep routine, right? So normally this is what your sleep routine looks like. And then one of those nights, it's like this. Well, you're missing out because of that chronotype, because of the way our bodies and our cells work, you're missing your, you could be missing a huge percentage of your REM sleep, which is that consolidation mm -hmm. or that slow wave sleep, which is very much about brain aging and health. So what I find is not, I find a better question isn't, do I need eight hours of sleep? I think a better question, Kitty, for people is, are you getting eight hours of sleep? Because mm -hmm. at least here in the United States, more than 50% of the adult population in the United States is trying to get by on less than six hours of sleep, right? So they're not getting anywhere near the amount of sleep that their body needs to keep their blood sugars regulated, to keep their weight regulated, to focus on um, healthy immune function. Mm -hmm. um, individuals that even have like a really rough night of sleep and um, that miss out on sleep have a 70% reduction in their natural killer cells the next day on measurement. So when we disrupt people's sleep, like let's say it's like a, a tone in their ear, like they think they're sleeping, but we put a sound tone in their ear. Um, and so they just not really sleeping. We change their immunity after one night, right? So imagine not getting a good night's sleep night after night after night. Well, this is when your C-reactive protein goes up. This is when your libido goes down. This is when the centimeters around your middle go up. This is when your sociability goes down. So um, we definitely need to pay closer attention to sleep and the things that disrupt sleep, like temperature. Um, you know, your, your temperature in your house should be lower at night so that you can get a good night's sleep. You should not be consuming caffeine later in the afternoon, even you guys, because um, I'm one of them that says, but coffee doesn't bother me. I have coffee at dinner all the time, right? You know, or I could. Um, the, the idea there is um, what coffee does is it's thermogenic. And that, that's why people love it for weight loss or they believe it helps them with weight loss, right? But it's thermogenic. So it's keeping your temperature up, which means it's really preventing you from getting a good restorative night sleep. Um, you know, I mentioned the lights, you know, there's some good evidence that lighting your house with like Himalayan salt lamps, that's the way to go. Not only does it calm you down, but that's a very low light, right? The lumens are very low, like weird things, Kitty, like don't go into a supermarket after dark because the lumens in a supermarket are off the 
rails, right? Like how bright those lights are. And those are the things that really disrupt our sleep. Um, so while I am concerned with the percentage of the population that doesn't sleep well, I'm definitely concerned about the concern, uh, definitely concerned with the issues associated with elevated blood sugars, inflammation, low um, immunity. Probably the one that bothers me the most is the link to poor sleep and cognitive decline. Um, and this isn't, mm, where did I leave my keys? Uh, this is, what is my husband's name, right? <laughs> it's that kind of cognitive decline, that a lack of sleep, um, you know, or why we need to address that. Um, with, and this is, this is where it gets kind of insidious because with age comes less, less of those deep wave sleep cycles, less of that good REM sleep. In fact, um, by the time you're 70, um, you're getting um, probably 80% less deep wave sleep than you were in your teenage years. Something else that happens um, besides significant risk, individuals that don't sleep, um, they end up having more proteins deposited in the brain um, that lead to cognitive decline. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's very easy to measure just simply by fragmenting somebody's sleep, you can see a rise in these proteins. Well, ultimately these proteins end up disrupting cognitive function and memory in later decades of life. But something that we notice, and maybe this helps people get a good night's sleep, something that you can notice much earlier than cognitive decline in your 70s, 80s, 90s, is that people that don't get a good night's sleep, Kitty, um, when you, we don't sleep well, our, pre, our mid uh, medial prefrontal cortex, most people just refer to it as the prefrontal cortex, doesn't communicate with the emotional center in your brain called the amygdala. And so this is kind of like the gas pedal and the brake. So your amygdala is an emotional center in the brain. And it's what makes you react. It's what makes you mad. It's what makes you, you know, want to pound your fists on a table. It's the thing that um, makes you, you know, be the warrior that you were, right? When we had to really be alert and fight for our lives. The prefrontal cortex, on the other hand, is the part of the brain that kind of puts the brakes on that accelerator. It says, whoa, 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 step back. You probably read what they wrote in that text message wrong. <laughs> you know, you just, whoa, slow your roll, reread the text, try to put yourself in another person's position. Where were they standing in the room when they wrote it? That's probably what they meant, right? Giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, that's when you don't sleep, your prefrontal cortex doesn't work properly. Um, another way, uh, and th this is a concern because we, we don't just see people have hostility. We also have people not being able to control their impulses. Prefrontal cortex is also intimately linked to attention deficit, to um, concerns that we have with um, spectrum disorder, that we have with um, impulsive behavior, reward behavior, um, um, you know, didn't learn from your behavior. That Those are all issues of the prefrontal cortex. And so when you don't get a good night's sleep, you might start to behave in a way that's not just unbecoming, right? It's nothing that you'll be able to sustain, right? You're, you're either going to get punched in the face, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you're, or you're going to be impulsive enough that you're going to get into an accident. But mm -hmm. I, again, I'm going back to this. My biggest issue with the people that don't get enough sleep and the best way to get a good night's sleep is to have a sleep routine, right? Go to the bed at the same time each night and wake up at the same time each morning. Because that way you don't miss out on the 20% on either side if you have an erratic sleep cycle. Um, routines are one of the ways that you establish now it's time to go to bed and people will sleep better. But like I said, my biggest concern with people not sleeping isn't the fact that they're waist or their hips get bigger or that their blood sugars go up. That's problematic enough, but I'm very concerned about where their brain will be, their cognitive function, their ability to recognize their family in later decades of life. I'm really concerned about that in people that do not get a good night's sleep. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, Kitty, that's a great question. And I, I legit could talk about sleep for a really long time and I'm trying to. Um, um, <laughs> Um, cause it, it is one of my favorite topics, but, um, Eric, you had, you had let me know that, of, um, 
um, from the field when we were um, writing questions to um, MA Healthy Living, one of the things that came up and when you and I had a chance to talk about the fact that your dairy product, your dairy question was so popular. And so I wanted to ask if you wanted to come on the show, because of course, that's how everyone gets to come on. That's not true is that they've written in a question and, um, and, you know, they've been participating in the 28 days and a question gets asked. And I said, well, let's just ask that live. And so when Eric and I were talking about this, one of the things that popped up, that was also a very common question um, because I had previously done a, a talk on sexual health and well-being was, um, you know, some of the sexual health questions. And so you had actually said that you were uh, working with a client, Eric, that asked us um, a question. So lay that question on me because I, I told you I thought everybody would really benefit from this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's one of those things that most guys are afraid to talk about. So I'm blessed to be able to do this with you tonight. But um, a lot of comments and concerns were, uh, Dr. D, it hear, you hear it a lot from guys that it happens to all guys at least once. Yeah. Is that true? It is true. And in fact, I, I could say that's sort of true because it happens to guys more than once, <laughs> right? It's <laughs> normal to happen more than once. Um, yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of men will get, um, for obvious reasons, will get very concerned about function, sexual endurance, sexual vitality. And um, what I want men to know is that there are multiple components to this and all of them are within um, control, right? So the first one, it's you know interesting that this question actually, now that I'm thinking about it, follow to sleep question, because men that don't sleep well, their testosterone. Um, so if I remember this study, men that, men that sleep five hours or less a night have testosterone um, that of a, a man 10 years their senior, right? Mm -hmm. So sleep might be one of the more impactful ways that someone, a man could do something about erectile dysfunction or erectile concerns. That being said, there's these paths that get there. Um, stress is a huge one. So there's a hormone in the body called sex binding globulin hormone. And that's what uh, is bound to testosterone. And it's bound in men and women, but it's bound to testosterone. And really what's helping men with virility, that's helping men with um, robust sexual appetite, with endurance, um, is free testosterone. And what that means is that that testosterone is not in fact bound to the hormone. So it needs to be free and floating. Um, stress is one of the major players in grabbing on to that testosterone and not letting it go. It's what initiates. It's not what initiates. I take that back. It's one of the factors in why sex binding globulin hormone won't let go of your testosterone, both men and women. So stress would be the next thing I would pay attention to um, is evaluate the stressors in your life. It's while I can appreciate that it may have something to do with your partner, right? Um, what I don't want men to fear or have concerns with is that this is an issue with their partner, meaning that they don't love their partner anymore, that they're not sexually um, aroused by their partner anymore. And that kind of goes back to what we talked about in the sexual health um, segment um, earlier on in our 28 days of health is that cuddle, um, that cuddles, that uh, um, couples that have um, more satisfaction, more sexual satisfaction, even if they don't have more frequent sex, are couples that cuddle, that have an intimate touch regardless, whether it's a sexual touch, they have intimate touch. Um, and so stress is going to be one of those things that we pay attention to. But during this time, again, in some level of assurance of caring for your partner, cuddling is one of the ways that we can kind of improve that situation, um, blood sugar. So again, when we think about function, erectile function, the um, ability to maintain an erection, get an erection, maintain an erection, it's important to recognize that blood flow has a great deal to do with that task. And so a healthy cardiovascular function and blood sugar, they really go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin when it comes to erectile health. 
that we want to make sure that our blood sugars are within healthy ranges. We want to make sure that our heart is within healthy ranges. You know, um, they often, they often will, um, say that, um, you know, um, you know, it's just one of my favorite jokes, but, um, they'll, you know, they'll say, they always say that erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mines, right? That, um, when there's ED, there's concerns with, um, uh, hardness or being able to maintain an erection, that there's probably something already going on in the heart. And so it's worth paying attention to that. And then the next one is excess weight. Um, weight, whether we link that to blood sugars or we just link it to the inflammatory nature of carrying extra weight. Um, we do see men that are um, obese, um, um, not just mildly overweight, but are carrying, a, they don't have to, they don't have to be freakishly overweight, but men that are carrying a lot of extra weight, right? So we're going to put them in the obese category, not um, the overfed category. Um, these men do have lower testosterone partially because fat is so estrogenic, which is why we are, we talk often about um, reducing a woman's risk for breast cancer by lowering her total body fat um, because um, fat is very estrogenic. And so a man that carries extra fat will actually pull his testosterone into estrogen. And so I want to make sure that we're also paying attention to fat factors when it comes to helping someone with sexual function, sexual desire, because it's also linked, um, you know, body weight, um, the way we feel um, naked um, often is a part of how we perform naked. And I think that's, uh, I think that's something to pay attention to, you know. Um, my mom uh, told me that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I found out much later in life, Eric, that my mother was aiming too high, <laughs> right? Um, in fact, if we can help men with sexual health, sexual function, we do a very good job um, keeping other factors like cardiovascular health, blood sugar health, body composition, mental, emotional health in check. It just so happens that what gets measured gets monitored. And that's often a measurement in men um, as to their overall health and well-being. So it's always um, um, a part of my questionnaire with men is it, how, how do you feel sexually? How do you feel desire-wise, arousal-wise, and the ability to maintain an erection? Because it is that canary in the coal mine. It does help the practitioner. It does help the spouse, the partner identify when there might be something else going on. So I appreciate Eric, you asking the question um, because it's not always an easy question for people to ask. And yet it's um, so important for um, their well-being. Sexual health is really important for individuals' well-being. Now, um, this is the part of the show where we um, look at the field and we ask some questions and I um, am just going to try to find the, uh, the window that allows me to do that. So bear with me for a minute. I do have some other questions that came in from um, the field, but um, here we go. Nope, that's the chat, but I'm sure other people, I'm sure they've asked in the chat. Let me find, here's the Q and A. You think I'd know how to do this by now, right? <laughs> um, so let's get some from the field. Um, Dr. D, I've always heard that if you run a lot, it will eventually damage your knees. Is that true? Um, yes, I would say that's absolutely true with this caveat. Um, those that run a lot, um, just like I would say to anyone that exercises a lot, um, if you're exercising, you need to give your time, your body time to recover as well. It's not just about pedal to the metal. You also need to recover. There are many ways that we go, excuse me, go through recovery, um, help people with fitness recovery and supplementation is one of them. So what we need to do is appreciate that that is wear and tear on the joint, a very buoyant require, a, a, a joint that requires a lot of buoyancy. So things like omega-3 fatty acids that can improve joint buoyancy, um, anti-inflammatory botanicals like pycnogenol um, can be very beneficial in stopping the nature of inflammation from wear and tear, whether that's age-related or it's exercise-related. 
Um, you know, um, hyaluronic acid isn't just for beauty or, or skin ceuticals. While we um, often will have um, precursors to hyaluronic acid in skincare products, actual hyaluronic acid in skincare products, um, hyaluronic acid in the joints continues to make them slippery. It's called a gag. And mm. these gags um, create that synovial fluid, create that joint lubrication. And so um, supplementation, rest, um, obviously warming up, um, you know, greasing the groove. I think this is running is probably where that came from. But, um, you know, all of those things um, are things that will um, improve the longevity of the joint. Doc, can I ask you a question on that one? Yeah. Um, what about the, um, the actual, uh, what you're running on? That's like, a, I mean, that that's a, a, yeah, that's a great point, Eric. Um, so obviously different terrain is um, going to uh, produce different, um, you know, it's like different data points underneath your feet, right? So trail running um, is not flat, it's not consistent, and that's like an agility balance type of thing. You know, someone may say you're also more prone to injury if you don't have a stable or flat running surface, right? But there is some level of trail running that kind of brings us back to like all of those more data points on our feet, kind of five finger type stuff, where we become um, better balanced, more agile, easier to react, bob and weave in a run. And then there is, you know, the benefit of having the benefit of being able to run on a track, maybe made out of recycled tires, something like that. Um, you know, maybe Paul Allen can get one of those, you know, who owns Nike, maybe he can get one of those in all of our neighborhoods, but um, uh, made from all of his shoes. But the, um, the ben there are huge benefits to running on a more buoyant, more forgiving um, space like that. And so some of those recreational tracks can be just the thing to do to maintain longevity of the joint. That's a great point. So Dr. D, I've always heard that it's okay to drink your water recommendations for proper hydration um, all in the morning and then leisurely drink in the afternoon so you don't stay up all night going to the bathroom. Is that true? I'm going to be honest and tell you that that doesn't sound true, but I can't say, I, nope, it's not, it's not true. And the reason why it's not true, I've had to go through a couple of things in my head. It's not true. I mean, and the reason why I think I questioned it for a minute is because I get a ridiculous amount of water in in the morning. It just, but it's still a constant fire hose, as it would. I just continue that throughout the day. So I was like, could I? So, um, no, I mean, the way the kidneys work, they're not holding on to that and being like, you know, Georgie, we're just going to hold this water over here for a little while because we know that you're not going to drink as much later, right? I do, however, think that depending on age, um, bladder strength, um, muscle strength, being able to actually, the detrusor muscle that actually helps us hold urine in, I do think that is a critical factor in whether or not someone's going to drink um, mm -hmm. late at night. I often get asked questions about um, isotonics at night and can I mix them in less water? Cause I'll just end up getting up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and that's perfectly acceptable. It's far more important that you get your nutrients in than you worry about the osmolarity. Um, when they're on an empty stomach, you've already um, improved that, um, you know, one of the factors that we require for isotonicity and rapid movement. At the end of the day, fat is what stops something from leaving your stomach. So please don't worry if at night you decide to mix something with less water. So Dr. D, have I, I've heard that consuming sugars, glucose, fructose, and other carbohydrates all the time keeps you as a diabetic and will keep you fat. Uh, someone used the F word. Therefore, sugarless foods and supplements are required, especially for diabetics. Is this true? It is absolutely not true. Um, your body's preferred energy source is glucose. Your brain's preferred energy source is glucose. And it will shift in the absence of carbohydrates to ketones. Um, but ketones are just another uh, deriv uh, you know, derivative of a carbohydrate. It's taking a glycerol 
a sugar and um, from fat, the fat storage of sugar and turning it into um, fuel that your brain can use. So I think the question is not about is consuming sugar uh, or consuming carbohydrates a problem because of course your fruits are carbohydrates, your vegetables are carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. It's the um, relative amount of simple carbohydrates that you're consuming um, um, in ratio to your proteins, which of course slow down carbohydrates, especially in diabetics. It's one of the ways that we work with diabetics um, that, you know, fat in its natural state, again, will blunt the impact of a sugar. Um, definitely when you look at the literature concerns with excess storage of say fructose in the liver, I do require over a hundred grams of sugar, right? And so during the course of a day, do you get a hundred grams of fructose? Mm -hmm. um, um, in, in certain foods, you absolutely can do this. So the question isn't, can my body handle a hundred grams of glucose fructose? It's the real question, can my body handle sucrose, like table sugar? Because that's really what we're concerned about, mm -hmm. right? We're really concerned about high fructose corn syrup. We're concerned about sucrose, like table sugar. We're worried about added sugars um, and an appreciable number of grams in the added sugars. So one of the things that I think is worth paying attention to is um, a lot of people are surprised to find out how many grams of fructose are in fruit. Um, or even vegetables for that matter. There's 12 grams of fructose in a serving of asparagus. There's 30 plus grams of fructose in a six ounce glass of orange juice. Mm -hmm. So, um, and obviously if you're eating the orange, which is preferred, right? You're gonna get some fiber, but you're not going to get a meaningful amount of fiber to really blunt that the same way protein or fat in its natural state or um, some starch your vet, I'm sorry, some fibrous vegetables would help you there. So the question is more about sugar is keeping us fat. It's also keeping you in a state of a massive oxidative um, stress. But even with that, it requires a, um, a pretty good gram dose for that to be the case on a regular basis, not the total daily load, but what are you consuming in one sitting? And that's my biggest concern. Uh, even for a diabetic, their concern, their concern is in a sitting, right? Okay, but it's a great question because there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about sugar. Dr. D, I've heard that we need prebiotics in addition to probiotics. Is that true? Um, that is true, but I think people underappreciate where their prebiotics are coming from. They're coming from your vegetables and your fruits, mm -hmm. mostly from your vegetables, far less from fruits. Um, fruits are um, percentage wise are going to be far more sugar than they are um, the fibers that we need that create that prebiotic load. Um, I mentioned some prebiotics tonight, um, inulin, chicory root, Jerusalem artichoke, apple pectin, fibrosol 2. These are all prebiotic fibers. Okay, I'm going to do one more. Um, hi, D. Um, um, does yogurt fall under dairy? With a capital D, capital A, capital I, <laughs> capital R, capital Y. Yes. Dairy or yogurt falls under dairy unless you're getting it from sheep or you're getting it from goat. And those do exist. There are alternative ways to get yogurt. Um, but keep in mind, regardless of the source of your yogurt, turn it over, um, take a page out of the question that we just answered about sugar. There are a lot of added sugars to many commercial yogurts. So if you don't make your own yogurt, that's cool. I don't make mine either, right? <laughs> but make sure that you're getting unsweetened yogurt. Um, you're sweet enough. Okay. Yes. You guys, it is so much fun to do this. You might remember that next week is our last, that's not true. And oh. we are going to be doing a best of show. I will be grabbing some of the favorite questions that have come in from um, MA Healthy Living that have come straight in through many of the comments on um, the hashtag 28 days where you guys are sharing your own health tips with your community um, or sharing ours. 
Um, we're going to have a big um, week next week, and I can't wait to see all of you. Before I let you go, I just want to recommend one important tip for your well-being, and that is spend some time this week writing a handwritten letter to someone. It could be someone you've lost contact with. It could be someone that you talk to all the time. But when we are just getting this kind of communication, um, it is such a novel thing to receive a letter in the mail, a card in the mail, something handwritten. Um, I think in this high-tech world that we live in, it is absolutely fantastic to go old school and tell someone that you care. Until I get to see you next time, go be healthy, go be brilliant.